Good evening. Is it too loud? Okay. Um, as chairperson of the Endowment Lectures Committee of the Asiatic Society of Mumbai, I have the pleasure of welcoming you here in Andarbar Hall for the 28th Justice K.T. Taylor Memorial Lecture. We have the honor of having with us today the eminent art historian Dr. Sarim Doshi. She will speak on spiritual splendor, the Jain temple Dharna Vihara at Ranapur. We are also privileged that Dr. A.P. Zamkhedkar, currently Chancellor of Deccan College Pune and former Chairman of the Indian Council of Historical Research, Delhi, will be presiding at this lecture. I thank these two living legends who are truly distinguished scholars for having accepted our invitation and being with us here. Before I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Zamkhedkar, allow me to introduce the endowment and later give you some brief details about the speakers for today. So, Justice Kashinath Trimbak Tela was born on August 30th, 1850. He belonged to a middle class Hindu family. He studied at a Marathi medium school and later was sent to learn English at the Elphinstone School at the age of nine. He passed the matriculation at the age of 14 with Sanskrit as a second language. At 17, he took his BA degree. At 19, he passed the MA, then the LLB examination, and three years later, the advocacy examination. Thus, at age 22, he was qualified for the legal profession. Taylor was offered the headmastership of a high school, but he refused. He wanted to follow in the footsteps of Mahadev Govind Ranade and Bal Mangesh Wagli, who had preceded him at the bar. He thus became an advocate of the High Court. His arguments soon drew the attention of the Bombay High Court, and judges began to compliment him openly from the bench. He had, com he had complete command of the English language. Moreover, his mastery of Sanskrit enabled him to study and quote the Hindu law books with ease. Taylor was offered judgeship at the age of 39 in 1889, which he accepted. He helped to clean up the law of succession to Sridhar property. Both as a lawyer and as a judge, he contributed a great deal to formulate clearly the canons of Hindu law. Justice Taylor was a great champion of women's causes. According to him, education for women was the most effective agency for bringing about a desirable change in society. Above all, he was against the spread of moral and social anarchy. He was for orderly progress. Order and progress, he said, must go hand in hand. He was a leading proponent of literary, municipal, and social work in which he played an active role. His learning and scholarship found recognition as in, in his being elected in 1892 to succeed Sir Raymond West as the president of the Bombay branch of the Royal Asiatic Society. His work in education was recognized by the award of CIE and by his nomination to the office of the vice chancellor of the University of Bombay in 1892, an honor which unfortunately he did not live long to enjoy. He passed away in September 1893 in the prime of his life at the age of 43 years. So, Justice Taylor was indeed a great man, an eminent Indologist, the first Indian president of our society, and the first Indian vice chancellor of the University of Bombay. Tributes were paid to him by Englishmen and his countrymen alike. John Adams wrote that India lost in Taylor's death, one of her wisest counselors, one of her most brilliant scholars, one of her choicest speakers, and one of the best men. Funds for this endowment were set up in, in the 1990s. They came from many, including his descendants. His portrait hangs in our Darbar Hall, if you look up there. Uh, I am not going to talk about Dr. Saryu Doshi in the conventional manner. She says it is too boring. So I agreed with her to attempt a revised format, which hopefully will be to her liking. 
This young lady, young at heart, is a living legend in the art history world. However, I should not give details of all her accomplishments, of which there are very many. An eminent scholar of Indian classical and contemporary art, she was honorary founder director of the National Gallery of Modern Art, Government of India, Bombay, from 1996 to 2005. During her term, she curated 13 major exhibitions. She was pro tem chairman of the Lalit Kala Academy from 1999 to 2002, and from 1981 to 1986, editor of Mark Publications. She has also been a visiting professor at the University of Michigan and at the University of California at Berkeley. Saryu Ben has a doctorate in ancient Indian history and culture from the University of Bombay, and thereafter she did a postdoctoral research at the University of Chicago. Among the major awards received by her are the Padma Shri in 1999, the Order of the Star of Italian Solidarity in 2006, given by the Italian government for a contribution towards promoting Italian culture in India and the Lifetime Contribution Award by the Art Society of India. She has written several papers and books on art, history, and culture, and edited a number of books, journals, on similar subjects. She has lectured on art in various museums and universities in India and abroad. She is a frequent commentator in the press and media on art-related issues. Saryu Doshi has also served on the boards of various universities and academic institutions and cultural organizations. She was a member advisory committee, Indian Council for Cultural Relations, as well as a trustee, the CSMPS Museum. Currently, she is a member of the Apex Committee of the National Gallery of Modern Art in Delhi, vice president of INTAC Delhi, and member, Board of Trustees of the Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts in Delhi. And, I say proudly, she was a trustee of the Asiatic Society of Mumbai from 2005 to 2011. Currently, as a trustee of the Vinod and Saryo Doshi Foundation, Saryo Ben oversees the annual Vinod Doshi Theatre Festival, which showcases experimental theatre productions from young and independent theatre artists in the city of Pune. Saryo Ben, I hope I have not bored you, <laughs> but I am sure that you will you will now be an increased interest, there will now be an increased interest for students of art history to try and follow in your footsteps. And that is why I was keen on saying all this. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to this lecture. And we think of him as our own Dr. Zamkhedkar because he has been on the managing committee and he's been a vice president, etc., etc. So, um, just to give you a little bit of background, Dr. Zamkhedkar is an alumnus of the Deccan College Postgraduate Research Institute in Pune. I will not be able to elaborate on all his impressive and wide achievements in the interest of time and not for any other reason. Uh, in Mumbai, he is closely associated with institutes of culture and higher learning, like the Anantacharya Indological Institute, the KJ Somaya Center for Buddhist Studies, Center for Archaeology, University of Bomb, Mumbai, Nyana Prabha, and the CSMBS Museum. And he has been a vice president of our society from 2007 to 2013. Since 2016, he is the Chancellor of the Deccan College, Pune. He was Chairman of the Indian Council of Historical Research, New Delhi, from 2018 to 2021. He is a recipient of the DLIT Vidyanidhi of the Tilak Maharashtra Vidyapit in Pune. He was awarded the Silver Medal of the Asiatic Society of Mumbai, 1983-86. The Shiva Chhatrapati Puraskar Nagpur, Manjushri Puraskar, and Kamla Devi Jain Puraskar of the Indian Society for Buddhist Studies. Dr. Zamkhedkar has been a prolific writer and has many published books to his credit. I don't think I should read out the list. 
unless somebody insists. And this is only a very brief sketch of his remarkable career and his research activities. And now it's over to you, sir. I invite you to take over the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming today. And today being such a rainy day, it's wonderful to see so many people come. And I hope that the temple at Ranakpur will prove interesting enough for all of us. We think has turned out very well. More than that, today is the first time I've heard the achievements of Mr. Telan, whose endowment lecture this is, and I am honored and really thrilled to be giving this honor, getting this honor to talk in his name. Because his career, for the first time, I heard all his achievements at such a young age, and uh, you know, with the qualifications he had of having studied in Marathi, being in Sanskrit, and still being able to run the courts in English, was really a superb achievement. And to have made becoming a vice chancellor of Bombay University before, at the age of 40, was a tremendous sort of feather in his cap. And so it humbles me to be here, to be giving a lecture in his honor. And at the same time, I'm extremely honored to do that. So today we are going to talk about this temple in Ranakpur. It is a remarkable temple, an extremely unusual temple. And as we go along, you will see what I mean by saying that why it is a magnificent monument of Indian architecture. It is a temple that is called Ranakpur because it was a place called Ranakpur. But the real name of the temple is Dharna Vihar because it was built by a man called Dharna. And it is, it is in his, I mean, he spent about 50, 60 years of his life trying to build this temple. And he is the one uh, who, uh, who supported it. Actually, the temple took more than 100 years to build, so it was not only just his lifetime, but the lifetime of many people that did, but it has gone through a very colorful history, and I would like to talk about that. Dharna Vihar is <clears throat> a temple that is, as you can see, located in the hills of Aravali, and it, is, it has all the jungle behind it, and it's located on the bend of a river called Magha River. And the river is a small stream, not really a very big river, and all full of boulders, but the location is really marvelous. Excuse me, the next please. So it is, it is situated, Ranapur, as you can see on the map, it is situated between Udaipur and Jodhpur. It is halfway between them, nearer Jodhpur than Udaipur, but the hills are there and the location is very, very, it's sylvan, serene, beautiful, and really remarkable. Next, please. Now, what, we, what I want to tell you about this, this particular temple, this is the Ranapur temple and its location. This temple was built by Dharna Sah. Now, who is Dharna Sah? Dharna Sah was a merchant prince, and they used to live near Sirohi in Jodhpur. Many years later, they found that they would prefer to go to Mewar, where Rana Kumbha was ruling, and so they came there, and they settled near, uh, near Udaipur, what is now Udaipur. Now, Dharna Sah was a very astute, an able person and very resource, resourceful also, with the result that he made a master of vast fortune. He also came from a very distinguished family of Jains, because the Jains merchant princes who are known as Sa, which comes from Sahabu, Sahukar. You know, the, it's a shorter form, and that's why you get Shah and Sa. It's the same word, Sa and Shah. But he was from a Sahukar family, and his family were known as Sangapatis because many Jain, shall I say, merchant princes used to take pilgrimages. 
They used to invite people to join the pilgrimage and they take, took them to various places, organized everything, their arrangements for stay, their arrangements for travel, the arrangements to visit the various temples and pilgrimage sites and to do pujas and everything there. So they were known as Sangapatis and Sangapati became Sanghvi for short. So he came from a very eminent family and he was settled in Mewad. And when the Rana heard about him and his abilities, he invited him to join the court. So he became a member of the Udaipur court. When he was a member of the Udaipur court, he, he helped the Rana so much that he, was become, he became one of the favorite few of that court. One night, while he was asleep, he had a dream. And in that dream, he saw a, Viman, a celestial vehicle. You know, the Jains have this mythology that uh, God's divinities fly in the sky in, a, in different types of vehicles. And this vehicle was called the Nalini Gulma Viman. Now, what is the meaning of Nalini Gulma Viman? It means that it looks like a lotus cluster. And if you look at this temple, you will see that from afar, it could be seen, you know, imagined as a lotus pond, because there are round shapes, there are pointed shapes that look like buds, half open shapes of, you know, like lotus flowers, full open shapes. So that sort of cluster imagination he saw. And he decided that he would like to build a temple that looks like that. So he went to the Rana and said, I, this is my dream and this is what I would like to do. And the Rana was very happy and he said, I will help you with this. I will help you by giving you a piece of land at this place around at the bend of the river in a little valley, little enclave in the hills and that you can build the temple there. So he gave him this plot of land, but he made one condition. He said, you must build a town with it nearby, which of course Dharna was very keen to do because what is a temple in the hills in a deserted place and nobody goes there. So he agreed and then the work on, he started to look for a person who can build this dream for him. He invited a number of architects, he talked to them, he discussed his dream, he discussed what sort of plan he wanted, but unfortunately none of them could really quite quite grasped what he wanted or give him a plan that suited him. So then he was told there was an eccentric architect near where he lived in Sagri. He said, and he was asked, why don't you talk to him? So he went, this architect, his name was Deepaka, and he said to Deepaka, this is what I have in my dream. So Deepaka said, fine, we will be able to do it, let's start. And so. In 9, 1438 or so, the um, stone foundation stone was laid and the temple was designed and was going to be built next. And so this is the sort of temple that came up there in the hills. And you can see how big it is and how strong the foundation and the stone is and how well it is built. It actually looks like a fortress. If you really see it, it's closed from all sides. There's a very high foundation. And the enclosing wall above the foundation is turreted. So it's a place where it really looks like a fort. It gives, it's, a, it's sober, it's austere. The, mob, uh, the sort of stone that is used it is also gray with no, no pattern on it. So it has a very, very sort of forbidding ex uh, uh, exterior with all those turrets and all that you see. But even so, the idea is that it looks like, you know, those small shrines look like spears and that it was quite forbidding exterior. However, this exterior gives you no idea of the interior. Next. This is the interior. It's all open, it's pillared, it's beautifully lit, it has open courtyards, and what is magnificent about it, or spectacular about it, is the fact that it is lit with light that is either filtered or reflected or 
uh, you know, dialect. So you get these shadows and uh, quality of light which lights up these uh, pillars and ceilings and balconies and all so beautifully that this white marble dream really looks like something exquisite that one can see. So the exterior, my point here is the exterior gives you no hint of what is inside it. It's enclosed, it's austere, it's forbidding, whereas inside it is light, it's welcoming, it is beautifully lit, superbly crafted with uh, sculptures. Next, please. Now, this temple is also called Chatur No, it's called Chatur Mukh Temple. Now, what is a Chatur Mukh Temple? So, let me tell you more about it. But to understand it, you have to know the Jain cosmic cycle wheel of time. Now, the Jains believe that the cosmic cycle has existed for eternity and that it is like a wheel and it goes down and it goes up and it goes down and, it, and it's a continuous movement over time. But its downward movement, as you can see, is divided into six parts and the six parts are the topmost and the biggest section is the happiest part. And as you go down, downwards, it becomes less happy and less happy and less happy and then the very last one is a decidedly unhappy part. Now the human beings are born, are born throughout, but the Thankas are born in the third and the fourth section only. So in the beginning of the third section you have Avinath or Rishabhanath who was born there. And the last person is Mahavir, who was born at the end of the fourth cycle, the fifth and, and the fifth cycle, and uh, fifth section. And the last one is yet to come. So we have, according to the Jains, we are still going into more unhappy times. Next one, please. And one moment. And the reverse happens when the wheel goes up. And this up and down movement of the wheel is continuous and everlasting. Next, please. So here are the two Tirthankas, or the 24 Tirthankas that are born in those sections. The top one, the one on the left is Rishabhnath, the first one, and the last one is Mahavir on this side. So these two Tirthankas are the first and the last of the 24 Tirthankas. And next. Now, the Tirthankaras are usually born as princes. They lead a life of a very uh, enriching life. And then, at some time, they begin to feel dis disenchanted with the world. And they take diksha, and then they become mendicant monks, homeless monks, going everywhere. And then they become, they find omniscience. They become all knowledgeable and then they give a sermon. Then the sermon that they give is like that Samavasaran that I have shown you. It has three enclosures. The Tithankar is seated in the middle and his sermon is heard by everyone seated there. Now he is shown as four, quadruple image, which I have shown you there in stone. So the place where the person is seated in the Samavasaran is really four-sided. And therefore, he is heard in every direction, in every place. And the temple that Dharna Sah built at Ranapur was planned on the Samavasaran. As you see, that is the temple plan. And you see the four uh, uh, doors leading, four entrances leading into the center, where there is a four-sided image. So the, sum of, uh, uh, the temple of Ranapur is based on the plan of the Samasaran with a quadruple image in the center. Next, please. Now this is, that is why since it has four entrances, it is also called Chaturmukh Vimana. So here is the temple that what you see here. What I want to show you is that it is not just built 
as someone's imagination. There were architectural treatises in those days. Those treatises were, as you can see on the left, they were plans showing like this 12th and 13th century. And these treatises were such that this particular plan that is given could be enlarged ad infinitum by just adding more and more mandapas to it. You see the central mandap, then around it is a chain of uh, pillared, um, pillared vestibules and shrines. Then beyond that is another, uh, another uh, ring of shrines and vestibules. So this is based on the Samasaran concept of three enclosures with the center. And the Ranakpur temple was built like that. But what they did was they changed it a little. They made the inner temple as a temple, a temple with, you know, with a, a mandap in front and a big entrance in the front. And so it has four entrances. And, but this entrance in front of the temple is the biggest, as you can see here down below. That is faces the west and it is called the Chaturmukh Vimana because of that, because it has four entrances. And you see how it looks over there. And um, the main thing is that they have made a change in the plan by putting a little temple within this courtyard and the three rings of, uh, of pillared pavilions. Next, please. So this is how it looks. There is this open courtyard, there is the temple in the center, this is the uh, ring around it, and the last ring, which is of little shrines containing the images of 24 Tirthankars of various eras, and that looks, when you look at it, it looks like turreted background, and gave that impression of being a fort. There is the tree that you see at the back, is the Ryan tree, which is associated with Rishabha. And below that is a very tiny pavilion with the footprints of Rishabha in there. Next, please. So this is how it looks. Fully behind. And on the western, on the side that is facing us, was the town. And even today, many goat herds and farmers and all who go into those hills find little objects that must have been there 12th century, you know, in the 14th century. And they come back with coins or some sort of vessels and things like that. But now, I, I just want you to see the tallest shikhar is the main temple. There are those domes. And then there are those uh, enclosure shrines that you see. Next, please. This is the main entrance to the temple. You can see how elaborate everything is. It's not just one door that you enter. There are three sort of passages that go backwards, lead you inwards. It's a slow progression into the temple. And um, next, please. And as you enter, you see this. Now, this is a real marvel in carving, because what you see is a recessed ceiling with what is known as that figure called Kichaka. And on the side, there are panels of various uh, stories. But the main story in here is the story of monk Stulibhadra. Stuli Bhadra monk's story is that he was a young man and uh, from a wealthy family, and he used to live with a, uh, with a courtesan called Kosha. And for many years he lived with her in her home, and you know, with all sensual pleasures around him. And then one day he decided that he was disillusioned with that, and he went and took Diksha and became a monk. For several years he practiced his mendicancy, and then he decided, he was told by his superior monk, that if you think you're ready to go to the next stage, during the monsoons, when the monks are forbidden from traveling anywhere, they have to settle down at one place, they said, go to Kosha's house and see if you can spend the whole rainy season there. So he went there, 
and he was able to stay there with all these things, all sensual pleasures, all sexual activities going around him without being affected. And then it was clear that he was now ready to go and progress into the further stage of becoming the monk. Next, please. This, first I wanted to show you Kichaka, and I want you to uh, notice how rhythmic it is. You know, one, uh, one face with so many bodies, but if you notice the way the bodies are placed, the way the limbs are placed, and the posture of the bodies, that there is a certain rhythm to it. And that rhythm, in some way, is repeated in the border around it. You know, there's a certain undulating uh, movement to, the, um, to that scroll in the borders. All these are very, uh, very sophisticated, um, you know, expressions in sculpture to be able to do this in a really, in high relief with solids and voids and carving underneath and above. It becomes a very, very difficult task, but to do it with such skill is where we see the, the quality of this particular temple. Next, please. Now this is where Stuli Badra was. You can see these uh, uh, activities going around in that courtesan's house. Now the important thing is how would a, uh, a temple that is so puritanical in its views and its, uh, um, in its principles have such things in its temples? The idea is that these scenes are called, are put there to avoid the evil eye. I mean, I don't know the logic behind it, but that is what you see in many temples that they have put scenes of sexual activity and uh, those are put there to avoid the evil eye. So you find this also in this giant temple. It's a small panel. It's a panel that is in the ceiling. You can't see it very clearly. It is in the entrance, but it is there. Next, please. And then as you come into the entrance, you come in, this is what you see. See that the lightness, the reflected light, the filtered light, the direct light. This is, this is what a lot of architects today study. How is this done that you have all this uh, way in which you, you control light into the temple? And of course, that it is built by white mar in white marble makes it look very elegant. Now, this is the way to the shrine. Next, please. But before you reach the shrine, there is a dome above you. That there is a little pavilion. It's a domed, it's a pillared pavilion. And as you can see, it's pillar upon pillar. There's one pillar and another dwarf pillar on it, and another one which supports the dome. And then there is another balcony. So it's lit and air and cool. I was there in the summer because we had to do some work there. It was 50 degrees outside, but inside it was 45. It's a difference of five degrees because of the way in which it is built and the uh, pillars that you see there, the marble that is there. And of course, the expanse of the temple itself. Next, please. That's a detail of the dome. All these are minutely sculpted, and we'll see some more as we go along. But just to give you an idea of how it looks and how the soaring domes, the spread out vestibules, and uh, the corridors, the uh, pillared corridors around you, the pavilions, all that gives a wonderful feeling of various parts that are interlocked with one another to create this grand edifice. Next. Now we go into the temple, up the stairs, and towards the shrine. Next, please. There's the image of, Ma, of Rishabha. This is the one that is facing the west. There will be three other images facing the other cardinal directions. And in front of this shrine are mandapas. 
and they are the most ornate mandapas. You can see the pillars and you can see brackets and then on top of brackets are figures or, or designs. It's just one after the other, so much of sculpture around it. And on the, on the, in the cellar, that is the enclosure which, in which the images are put, you see sculptures of human figures. Next, please. Now, this is quite interesting because you see this is, on one side is the image of Dharnasa, the patron who commissioned this temple. And on the other side is Depa, the architect who built it or who designed it, let's say. Now, what is interesting is that this figure is put on a pillar which faces the shrine and looks at the image, you know, the way it is placed. Sorry, it goes like this. And Depa's image is placed here, so both of them can look at the image. And, and these images are placed above human height. So never is their <coughs> nazar impeded by any play. They have a direct look at the murti, and they see it 24 hours throughout the, <laughs> throughout time, let's say. So that is, on one side you have Dharna, and on the other side you have Depa. And to show patrons in sculptures in Jain temples is not unusual. You find them quite often. Next, please. And this is the ceiling in front of the shrine itself. Again, it is a stepped ceiling in courses which become a concentric courses which become smaller as they go up and then they're held together by these struts which show human figures. We'll see some more later. But what I wanted to draw your attention to is this arch. It is called the caterpillar arch but it is very skillfully done because it's one piece and it is, uh, it is carved through and through. And the same design is on both sides. Next, please. You can see this. You can see some of the holes, which will show that it's carved through and through. Now, since this temple is so old, there have been some changes in the type of marble used and also you get slightly different colors also. But on top of this arch, if you notice, there's a panel. And the panel shows the 14 lucky dreams that every mother of the Tishankar has. Before he is born, before he, she becomes pregnant, she sees these dreams which tell her that the, person, the child that will be born to her will become an emperor, either a spiritual emperor or an emperor of, you know, with a large empire. Next, please. So these are the sort of vistas of pillars that you see. On every side, wherever you look, you see these long vistas of pillars, all fully carved and beautifully carved. Next, please. Many of them are quite new, let me tell you, because the temple was uh, got ruined in between. I'll talk about it. But you see that these pillars, even today, maintain the same design qualities and the qual uh, and artistry as before. So these are the human figures that sometimes you see on the pillars. Next, please. This is the ceiling above in that pavilion. And you look up, like we do here, there is a ceiling of receding circular, concentric circles and then a pendant. This is put in a square frame, as you can see. Next. Now it's a hexagon. This is another one, hexagonal one. And if you see on the sides also, there are smaller ceilings with beautiful designs on the side. These are like over as tall as this, if not taller. Next. There are arches connected. Every, every single uh, unit is differently designed, but the entire design fits into one another to create a wonderful whole. Next, please. 
This is what I wanted to show you. There are these concentric courses with her design on it. Usually they are foliage scrolls or floral scrolls or abstract designs. Then they are held up by struts of human figure. Then in the middle is this pendant, which is carved out of one stone in the opposite direction from big, it becomes small and pointed. And that too is held together by struts. And then we have these bracket figures. As you can see this figure, that it's on the bracket and then again there are other brackets on top. But what I wanted to point out to you is if you notice this figure, graceful as it is, beautiful posture, but there is a certain linearity to it. There is a certain angularity to it. It's not just plastic, in, you know, soft and rounded. There is, if you see the cut of the knee, it's sort of uh, an, uh, an obtuse angle, but it's very sharp. So there is, this is the middle, medieval period sculptural qualities that we begin to see, you know, from very uh, wonderful sort of human figures. They become linear in this manner. Next. I'm just showing you a variety of figures. Next, you can see that musician up there. But look at the intricate details below. There are animals, there is the dwarf uh, that is holding up the bracket, then on top of the bracket is the figure. Around her are two brackets. Again, they have uh, designed, perforated design. Their postures are all very different also. Now look at this goddess. She is, I don't know if you can see it clearly, she's pulling, there is a, dwar a demon below, and she's pushing a sword-like uh, weapon into his mouth, and she has a ring on top, like a discus, that she may be throwing at him. Through the slow job. These are the panels that you see. You know, they are all throughout that entire edifice. You see these panels, you see the brackets, you see the dancing figures, you see. Um, beautiful uh, domes and pendant uh, designs. See, there is a half lotus design below, and there's uh, figures in uh, pillared pavilions. Then there is an abstract design, a geometrical design, then again a spear design. <laughs> when I was talking to one of the sculptors, he said, why these are bala designs, you know, like spears. <laughs> Jalebi design, when there are circles or spirals, this is how they described them. Next. Now this is the Kalpavali. This is one of the most famous and popular motifs in Indian art, at least in the art of Gujarat. It is called Kalpavali. And if you notice, of course, it's a very beautiful circular pattern. But look at the way in which the artist has done it. He has done it. There is this circular pattern, and below it, it's in high relief, one above the other. And that is repeated in the curves, in the circle, and in the sort of curvilinear form that you see. And then, of course, the edging. But it's, you know, it needs tremendous imagination to be able to carve something like this, which is at different levels. You carve below it, you carve above it, you place them in a proper perspective. So this, again, is a sort of, a sort of expression of the artist. And this, this particular motif is found in various uh, architectural monuments, including mosques.
Now this here is a particular figure that I want you to see right at the ex extreme end in that open area. You see a little thing and that is this figure on the right. This is the figure of Ratna Sa. Ratna was the brother of Dharna and he promised his brother he will complete the temple. The temple was completed, the inner temple was completed during Dharnasa's lifetime, around 1440. But it went on for many years and he saw to it that it is completed. Now at this point I want to tell you something very interesting about Jain temples. The thing is that a, a patron would decide that he is going to build this temple. But when he decides to build the temple, he is quite happy if the members from the community come and tell him we would like to contribute to it. And so the contribution is like they would give money for a pillar or a pavilion or a porch. So it is the combined effort of the community, combined effort of, poor, uh, of pious people and they are inscribed, so and so gave it and the main patron doesn't feel diminished by it. He is actually happy to have participants from the community uh, working with him to build this hymn of praise in the name of God. You know, this, they don't look at it as my temple or my thing, it is our temple. It belongs to the community. It adds to the sort of spiritual feeling in, among the community members. It is where they can come and they can pray and they can all, all get replenished and revived by the energy that is in a place like this. Now here, you see all this will look very similar to you. But when you are in the temple, it's on all four sides of you, in the front, on two sides, and at the back. So each of the mandaps that I'm showing you is a, from a different side. In this particular mandap, we are seeing an elephant uh, with a person riding in it, and a person seated behind. It shows Maru Devi. No, next, pick up. This is the elephant. There is the rider, and at the back, in a sort of a throne-like seat is seated a woman. That is Maru Devi. Maru Devi is the mother of Rishabha, the first Tirthankar. And when she heard that he had uh, attained omniscience and he was giving his first sermon, she came all the way to, uh, to listen to him. And then when from afar she saw his figure, immediately she got liberation and moksha. She never really heard him speak, she never met him, she never saw anything, but she, was the, she is the first person in this cosmic cycle to have attained moksha or liberation from the mundane life of our, of our everyday life. Next. Now this is Nandishwadi. There are plaques like this in various areas of the temple. This is Nandishwar Deep. Nandishwar Deep is, a, is in this cosmos, Jain cosmos, an island where there are these sort of arrangements of temples. And there was a poet called Meha who wrote on, uh, on uh, this temple, Dharna Vihar, and he said, as you can see, I have the plan there, that it, is, it resembles Nandishwadri, I pointed out why he thought he thought it resembled Nandishwadri. And that of course was a great compliment and of course everyone there was very excited by it. There's another plaque which shows the Parshvanath who was the 23rd Tirthankar. He was, he is closely associated with a snake because he saved the life of a snake and later on the snake, when he was being um, attacked by a deem, uh, uh, an enemy, let's say, he spread his hoods above him and protected him. And his wife held, her, held him on her hood so that there were rising waters, there was a storm created by the person, he was a celestial being, 
so that he could he was above the waters and protected protected from the water below by the nagini and protected from the water above from by the nag so he is always shown with a uh, seven hood uh, for a uh, hooded serpent a serpent and here you can see it has many hoods and then the nagini is next to him the tails are intertwined in this pattern around it again very ingenious this is a plaque showing shatrunjay what we call palitana temples so this is the sort of stylized version that you see in stone the very beautifully done it's about 4 feet high and all the temples are shown in it but what i want to bring bring your attention to is above at the very top just in the second level you see five little figures standing with this small those are supposed to be the pandavas who came here and they attained liberation and moksha over here at shatrunjay and now we come to the kshetrapal the kshetrapal is the uh, is the guardian divinity of the temple and he is worshiped every day and he is right on the in the cella that is in the shrine around the four around the tirthankars and he is worshiped every day and so this is how the temple was but around 1700 some between 1780 90 and 1700 armies of aurangzeb passing from delhi towards gujarat came and desecrated the temple it was broken and in ruins but to prevent any such further attack the jains built can you see at the corner a circular platform they built those circular platforms and erected minars on it so that from afar it would look like a mosque and not a temple and so the muslim armies would not be interested in coming to attack it however the muslims did not come but other factors ruined the temple such as famines there were long famines immediately after in 12 uh, 12 year 13 year 15 year famines the river dried up the people had nowhere to go because that was the only source of water and so slowly people started leaving the place and before long it was completely deserted and then it was overgrown with shrubs because there's a jungle behind it on the hill and wild animals started coming there and then the decoits made it their home so for 200 years it lay in total ruins all the pillars got broken the domes started falling apart and there was it was in a state of ruin let's say then around 1887 himabai hathi singh of amdabad he came from amdabad with with a sangha and when he came and he said i want to go and see this temple he was told you can't go because there are decoits in there there are wild animals there and it is infested by snakes so it is not safe to go there at all then he decided this this cannot be continued like this this shall be now repaired so he called arab guards to get the decoits out of the place and then he called people to clean it up and then with other amnavaj uh, merchant princes satyas as they are called they all got together and started the repairs of the temple so for the last 100 years the temple is being repaired it is being the pillars uh, which were broken are being put together and everyone comes there and now it is in a state where you can admire it and go to it and next what i want to show you is the temple is complete but what is very interesting is that ratnasa the brother of ganasa who built this temple he his descendants who had left the place 14 generations later come to put the flag on the spire of the temple depaka the architect his descendants 
come to supervise the repairs and sculptures and uh, take part in it. And the priest who does the puja over there, he, his 14th generation people come there and do puja. He was particularly brought from Chittor to, when the temple was built to do puja. Today, the 14th generation of that pandit looks after this temple. And I have been there in the evenings, and I can't tell you what a spiritual experience it is, because there are no lights. There are only, when you're there for the aarti, it's only the lamps. And the breeze, because it's so open around, there are trees, the breeze, every little bell on those uh, shrines starts tinkling. And, you know, there is darkness, there is the flickering light of the diyas, there is this tinkling sound, and they have two drums, huge drums, which they beat. And they call one drum masculine and one drum feminine. So when they beat, the sound is different. And that aarti has a reverberation throughout that temple, in that open area, the closed areas, and all that. It's, it's a surreal experience. You know, you don't get that sort of experience when you go to other temples. But to listen to that, the evening light, and to listen to that aarti is really a great experience. So in my opinion, and in my experience, it has been one of the most spiritual feelings to revisit this temple, to be in it, to look at its beauty, to enjoy its, its closed, um, uh, sort of compact space and its inner spaces which are so open and so beautiful and so beautifully embellished with all sorts of motifs and flowers. And then to listen to this aarti is one of the most climactic experiences of one's life. And I hope all of you will someday go to it and maybe experience the same. Thank you so much. and the craftsmen are trained in that. And then, as I said, this is the generation after generation doing it. But you are right, it is very difficult to tell. Even when we were there, we tried to see which, is, which are the new ones, which are the old ones. We thought by the color of the marble, we might be able to tell because of the older ones would have patina over it and the, young, and the newer ones would be new looking. But I have no idea why the uh, marble hasn't aged. Some places, you see, but I think that's because it may be from a different quarry. There were two quarries that were supplying marble, and those maybe had slight color differences. But, and we saw craftsmen at work there. And they were, you know, continuing the same traditions, the same feelings, and and, you know, in some way, you are quite, uh, quite surprised by the continuity and you are quite surprised by the, by the honesty of the people who are crafting to continue the same way. They don't want to change. They're, they're keen to continue to think. So there is a certain, you know, what shall I say, a convention, a tradition that is respected and that is followed. Yes? I can't hear you. There is a, there must be a mic. Huh? Is the carving done in place when the stone is put up? Or is the carving done in a more comfortable location and then put up uh, either plaques and so on? And the second question is there was one thing that we were told which was not uh, regular. It was made faulty by the architect to say that only God is perfect, I'm not. So, I, I can't hear you clearly, it's echoing. <laughs> uh, apologies. Uh, there was two questions. One is that 
was the carving on the, sto on the stones done on the ground or in a com comfortable location and then the stones, the plaques put up on the walls or was the carving done after the stone is put up in the particular place where it is located? And number two, whether one pillar is supposedly not designed for perfection deliberately because the architect said that I can't be perfect, I'm just a human being. I've seen that pillar, but I think the what you are thinking about is that the ceilings were carved on the floor and then with scaffolding put up. You know, they had scaffolding of all sorts. And I think they were put in place one by one, you know, mm. circle, uh, one circle by the other and in a manner like that. Even the, uh, even the pillars are in pieces, you know, there are uh, one piece, drum upon drum upon drum. Then the brackets are different. Go now, ahead. how they put all these things together that they interlock and nothing falls, and on that they have these figures, that's something that is really what is remarkable and skillful. And I think one has to study sculpture and how they put these things together, because it's done in so many temples, it's not just this temple. But I think our architects were extremely skillful, extremely clever, and um, above all, they were dedicated. They were dedicated to their profession, and they had a certain religious intensity and a religious ethos, which made them do what they did. Of one piece, or was it different pieces stuck no, together? No, it's one piece. One piece. And it's done in layers, if you saw. Yeah. In different layers, I mean, if you go into proportions, it will be one, one-eighth less, two less, that sort of thing. Was this done by traditional Sopuras, or they were different artisans? No, put the mic near uh, because it echoes. Was it done by traditional Sopuras? Yeah, they're done by uh, stone masons. Mm -hmm. Because you, as I explained to you, it's a common motif. You see it in many places. Yeah. But it's a very typical motif and very, uh, uh, very admired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And is it true that the marble was not damaged perhaps because Rajasthan and that area has such low rainfall? I have no idea whether it, there was some iron in the marble and that's why some places the colouring changed or whether the marble was, you know, I don't really know the quality of the marble, but it came from Sadri, they said. It is a scale that is remarkable. I mean, I'm told it's 3,700 uh, 3, square meters. I mean, I'm not very really sure whether that, uh, come, um, that figure is right. And they're like 1,400 pillars. Oh. So anywhere you look, it's like vistas of pillars, but beautifully done. And then you look up on those domes, and then on the sides, those, those little um, uh, uh, sort of little things that I showed, those little bits, uh, turret spires, those enclosure shrines, they're no more than four feet by four feet with a Tirthankar in it. So it is 24 Tirthankars of this era, 24 Tirthankars of the previous era, 24 Tirthankars of the future era, then some Shaswata Tirthankars and some from this and an era, that sort of. So they have about 108 of these little shrines. And so they make a very beautiful uh, enclosure wall, as you can see. Is it true that all... No, one has to study them. They all say they are different, but I'm sure it's the same designs put differently or executed differently. You know, the same creeper may be shown this way, it may be shown this way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Certain motifs must be common. But for all that, you require so much time to look and photograph and study and all. We all go for two days and three days. We can't really yeah, do all that and that true. much. However, those three days, psychological change comes over you while you're there. You know, the atmosphere and the way in which it affects you and what you see, what your eyes see, what your, body, uh, what your brain feels, what your heart feels. It's a, it's a very different and very, I mean, any temple is a great experience, but this temple is remarkable. Thank you. 
And somehow all of that is enclosed, you know, it's open and yet it's enclosed. So you feel it, it's kept within you, spiritual feelings. Uh, you just mentioned your... So thank... Oh. You just mentioned about the Mangal Devo Aarti in the evening. This has been going on since medieval time, so it's more of a recent phenomena, the Aarti and the... the I don't because know, either. I was there, I must say, about 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and it was there, and I'm told it is there every day in the evening. Yeah, I, even I've seen it, so I wanted, because I felt that a part of it was more contemporary. So is this uh, any reference over there that you can say which goes back to... Uh, 100, 200, 400 years back or something? No, I think it's fairly recent in the sense, maybe 30, 40, 50 years. It's, okay. it's, it's revived. It must have been there earlier, but mm -hmm. everything has been revived only in the last 30, 40 years. Because it was in ruins for 200 years. Yeah. Let's not forget and that. I, and it took time for all the pieces to be put together, for people to be able to come in. And so well, let's say from 1940s or 50s, it became a place which you could visit. Yes. I went there in the 80s, 70s and 80s. I went there first in 72, and then I think sometime in 1980. Did you get a chance to interact with Kasturbhai Lalbhai? Okay. Uh, did you get a chance to interact with Kasturbhai Lalbhai because he was a major person in the restoration of the uh, yes, temple? Yes, they spent thing like one crore and something, yes, yes. and now the restoration and renovation work is going on. But you know, it doesn't affect you because you get a feeling of the completeness of the temple. Yes. Yes. And uh, one more question, you know, when you mentioned about the minarets in the, uh, which were later on added by the people over there, uh, some of them look like also domes over there, which is more like a Islamic they are domes. Huh? There are domes. Yeah. So is that an Islamic influence over there? You? you see, that's what I'm saying, that he had this idea, so you get those uh, pyramidical ceilings usually, the domes. But this fansaka, fansaka or something it is called. But this dome, he wanted for it to look like the lotus cluster. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, currently, who manages this temple? Is it the community or is it like the archaeological survey of India or like the 14th generation of the Sompuras? No, I can't understand your question. It's getting very echoed. Uh, so currently who's managing who's the temple, right? this temple, is it like the Sompuras or the Archaeological Survey of India? Or no, the no, it's the Sompuras. Okay, so the 14th century, uh, I mean the 14th generation of the uh, Pujaris, of, they of the sculptors. That's what they say. Now maybe there are only two or three of them and there are rest of the other Sompuras. But to me it was exciting that for the 14th generation has come and the continuity is established. You know, from the beginning to today, maybe it's in it. and it gives such a uh, traditional, conventional look to the place. Doctor Boshi, it's managed by the Anandji Kalyanji Trust. It is uh, run by Kasul by Larabha Trust. Anandji Kalyanji is. And they are, uh, they are doing a... Shrenik Bhai was very responsible when we went there. He made arrangements for our stay and for photography and looking at everything. So may I thank you all for being here to stay for the whole lesson. I hope you, you enjoyed the place as much as I have and you felt the same sort of vibrations in it as I have done. And I hope someday, if you have not been there, to go again. And if you have been there, to go again and look at it with a different eye. Thank you so much. And more so in my case, because I had the good fortune, you can say, of a company here in her two trips to the temple. When you think about the Western Indian temples, they are unique by themselves. 
So are, of course, some of the temples in the south and also in the east, and also in the north. But the Western Indian Jain temples have a tradition of their own. In that, they are totally different from the rest of the temples of India. When you see an Indian temple, whether it is a Buddhist temple or a Jain temple or what we call now a Hindu temple, all of them they look alike. Because the basic concept of the temple itself is common to all the three or whatever more traditions in India, religious traditions in India. As I understand it, the development of the Indian temple starts with the house of the God. In fact, it was literally a house in the sense, in the case of Buddha, it was a hut. It was called Gandhakuti, a small hut, which was fragrant because of the flowers and other things which were hung at the ceiling. Then the Indian temple, round about 4th or 5th century AD, it is called Prasad, it is a palace, palace. And all of a sudden, all the stopatis who write on temple architecture, they never call it a devalaya or the terms which we use, they call it Prasad only. Because the development in the religious thought, you can say, is such that, well, the the God is thing, thought in terms of a king. So all the type of worship and puja which is done, it is in a manner a king will be received or given those formalities. And therefore the whole architecture is that of palace. Even if the palaces are not there today, Right from something like 6th, 7th century, you can imagine what type of palaces must have been there. Just imagine, after seeing the temples at Khajurao, what type of palace or types of palaces must have been in those times. In the case of Buddhism and Jainism, the temple takes altogether a different shape. And even though it looks like a prasada, it becomes cosmos, meaning the temple is identified with the cosmos. And the temple is something like the body of the God, and the inner image is something like the soul in that body. That's how it is thought of. But the Jain temples, they differ and deviate from this particular stage. I won't go into the discussion as to why it happened. A simple thing is, there is no concept of any almighty God, creator God in Jainism. And therefore, there is no question of the temple being a cosmos and the God who is the soul of that cosmos inside it. But it takes a different shape. From 5th century onwards, we find that there is a concept of eternal shrines. A reference was there, this temple is also uh, dedicated to uh, Rishabhanath, the first Tirthankara. The legion says that whereas many of the Tirthankaras, when they die, when they attain Nirvana, they, there is a place where all the all the Tirthankaras, they took their Nirvana, 22 Tirthankaras. But Rishabhnath and Neminath were exceptions. Rishabhnath attended Nirvana on Kailas. And Bharata Chakravarti, who was his son, emperor, he built temples made of diamonds and gold. Then he was afraid that, well, as the bad times were coming, as he was telling, all the Tirthankaras come, 
in susama susama after susama susama susam dusama and dusama susama these are the third and fourth so people become affected by the passions like greed hatred and other things so he thought that well greedy people might go and destroy those temples and therefore he made it inaccessible and that is why after first century onwards now they are trying to build up temples in the likeness of the temples which were there on kailas there were 24 temples and before the tirthankaras were born their temples were there their images also were there it's very funny that parshana for example who was uh, who held in 8th century bc he was being worshiped by krishna who was some hundreds of years ago him so these are some of the things which come in mythology you see so tirthankaras were worshiped there their shrines also were at war it is only those people who could fly could visit it so there is one soul one gautama ganadhara of mahavira swami who was able to visit that other people are not able to visit it and therefore now round about 8th 10th century again it is a question of time it is a very crucial time when this idea develops and then shatrunja is said to be the replica of kailasa temple that is why the main deity on shatrunja is rishabnath it's very sacred to all the followers of jainism and therefore now a a new temple type comes in chaturvimshati jinalay so at uh, near ambaji there is a group of temples from 10th century onwards this becomes a fashion then 24 tirthankara then the 24 tirthankaras of the past then the 24 tirthankaras of the future so this way chaupanna jinalay bavattarim jinalay that is 54 shrines and then 72 shrines myself and sarayu ben we were discussing as to ranakpur what must they must have been and as you must have noticed she showed that nandishwar dweep i shown again it is the eternal shrines 54 52 eternal shrines which are at the which are again inaccessible only gods can go then meru again inaccessible so all these symbols are there and this way it creates a sort of a an image of the sermon because the image faces all the four sides when a tirthankara gives his first sermon automatically his replicas are there on the three sides then all the jeevas they come to that place and it is wonderfully described that mahavira he speaks in ardhamagadi which is the language in the uh, in which the uh, canons are composed but everyone understands it in his own language so it is something like you know you can say hall that you speak in english but everybody gets the translation of it in the language so this is, this concept it may look queer or something like that but he emphasizes this another aspect of the indian religious tradition and that is every soul has the potential to become a sit every soul has to become potential has to have the omniscience and to emphasize that this concept of samansarana is come so i think when these temples they are being built up like that basic idea must have been also this that to emphasize that every soul has a future and that is why when maru devi she comes here is the first tirthankara he has yet to disclose the way one can attain salvation get omniscience but even before that she gets omniscience yes and in her earlier birth she was born as a plant so that means at spiritual level she was very low but then you cannot explain and that even she has got moksha emphasizes the same thing that every soul whether it is a small animal or a human being it has got the potential 
these western indian temples again impress me because of another thing you will find that from something like 10 to 15 this is the pinnacle you can say is the highest point of jain temple architecture according to me of a multi a multi you can say shrine temple and as someone was saying there are so many novel things you see if you see this temple there are different levels on which are there in in between there are four Jain shrines in which every shrine has got two jinnas. So in all eight jinnas have been. But then there are ups and downs. Myself and Sarvi we had to, to go up and down to see the different parts of the temple. So this Depa seems to be an altogether. Somebody said that there might be Islamic influence. I don't think because by that time whatever Islamic architecture, he might have been inspired. He, he must have been inspired in some ways, but he has expressed in altogether different way. Nowhere in any temple in Western India, if I remember correctly, there are two storied mandapas, you see, and domes, and the upper dome being open to the sky and air. It is called the Megha, Megha Vahana Mandapa. These are new ideas which are coming up, and these were, uh, these were brought into practice by Deva. If you consider many times we say that medieval times are the worst, you can say, pages of our history. But I think it has to be rewritten. It has to be understood in the terms of, is the, according to me, it should be, I don't know whether it is, but it should be declared as a world heritage monument. It is of that type. It is so unique. And another thing is, she made a reference to, um, Dharana Shah and Ratna Shah, they were Sangvids. See, so this new institution has come up like anything. I mean, I'm studying at present Sukruta Sagara. I mean, it is a very clear thing that the biography of a lay person has been written by a monk. The emphasis is on the lay person, the patron. Can you imagine there was one Petrada on whose life this epic poem is there? He constructed or innovated 72 temples right from Rameshwar to Rajasthan and right from Bengal to this place. So the role of the lay persons, especially the rich merchants, is altogether different. It has been told in a very small thing. See, at the end, he says, I don't, who is the greatest thing in this world? Meru is the greatest thing because he is the highest mountain. Then, after Meru, it is the permanent. It is greater because Meru cannot penetrate it completely. After the, this thing, who is greater? The clouds, because they bring rain. Cloud is great, but greater than the cloud is the sea because it is the source of the water of the sea that the clouds are created. Superior to him is the Rishi who drank up the whole ocean. But as compared to the Rishis, the Jinnas are even better. But then, it's a very strange note that the Sangha is better than the Jinnas. <laughs> Sangha is better than the Jinnas. The person who takes all the persons to the pilgrimage, he is superior to the Sangha. Probably because of the adverse times which came in 14th, 15th century, and a completely new chapter in Indian history was being written where all the Indian religions had to take a step backwards. Probably the, these rich merchants, lay followers, there is a description, I can tell you, in the Sukruta Sagara. And a Sangha went on pilgrimage of five places. These five places, naturally, Shatrunja, Abu, Girnar. Also, there is one Chandra Prabha temple at Patan and at Khambaya, Parshwanath. It must have been a journey of about, you can say, one and a half thousand kilometers. 
Do you know how many participants were there? Two lakh people. Two thousand carts. Then two thousand soldiers to protect them. Hundred cooks to look after them. It is such a wonderful description. So this was the way probably these rich merchants and lay persons, they revived the hope in the mind of the common people. And therefore, when we see these temples uh, and the persons who are responsible for their creation, one is inspired. And I think we should write now, read out our history, medieval history, because no mention is there. Except the, except the court records of the Mughals and others, and so many battles in which so many people were killed or something like that. There is no history, you see, for the medieval times. But unless we understand all this background, socio-economic and other things, as also religious aspirations, I think, so the history will be totally different, and probably this temple will be one of the most important chapters in the medieval history of Western India. Thank you. The Chaturmukha Dharna Vihara of Adinata is a fine example of Jain architecture and especially its unique carvings, which are well highlighted by Dr. Sarya Dushi. The absence of walls within the temple makes the fluidity of space quite conspicuous. The sculptures blend with the architecture and do not stand out. The temple's majestic exterior spaces are matched by the exquisite interior spaces. The flexibility of the raw material allows the treviated structure a rare integration of magnificence of architecture with intricate carvings without losing eye on elegance. The relief from the intricate carvings comes from the high relief sculptures that again become part of the architecture. On behalf of the Asiatic, I thank Dr. Saryu Doshi for explaining the complexities of Dharna Vihara in simple terms to us. Her talk was both interesting and enlightening. I thank Dr. Jamketka for giving a context to certain terminologies while presiding the lecture. He is always very good at that, and he, did it, he didn't disappoint us today. I thank the press for the coverage, and I thank our president for always encouraging us. I thank the staff of the Asiatic Society for cooperating with us in organizing this program. As always, I thank our audience uh, who has been our consistent support in all our programs and has always encouraged us. Thank you all and good night.